Well, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, it's still morning on the West Coast. So good morning to you on the West Coast. Good afternoon to you on the in the other time zones. Welcome to the first Homes for Horses Coalition webinar of 2021. Thank you for joining us. We are so pleased to have this tremendous turnout today. I'm Elaine Nash, Acting Director for the Homes for Horses Coalition. The Homes for Horses Coalition is made up of almost 600 equine rescue and sanctuary directors and other prominent figures within the cause of equine protection. Homes for Horses Coalition is an initiative of the Animal Welfare Institute. The Animal Welfare Institute is our parent company, as it were. AWI is an almost 70 year old nonprofit organization that through engagement with policymakers, scientists, industry, and the public seeks to alleviate suffering inflicted on animals by humans. Dr. Joanna Grossman is the equine program manager and senior advisor for AWI. She'll speak to us briefly after our guest presentations. Our program today is designed to be about 90 minutes long with a few minutes reserved for a question and answer session after the presentation. If you think of a question during the program, please write it using the Q&A tab and our guests will answer as many of them as time allows. Some of you may have other obligations that will require you to leave before do it or during the Q&As at the end. So please stay as long as you can, but we understand if you have to step away early. Also, as you may be aware, widespread internet issues have been reported this week for many websites and services, including Zoom where we are today. Thank you in advance for your patience with any technological issues we may encounter. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. If for any reason you're disconnected from us, you'll still receive a video recording. 2020 was a record setting year for the United States in some very unfortunate ways. We had five large landed hurricanes in Gulf and Eastern states, hundreds of devastating wildfires in Western states and drought followed by flooding and even a devastating derecho in the Midwest. And of course, every citizen of every state has been and still is affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The events of 2020 served as a stark reminder that natural disasters and major crises can occur anywhere and anytime. The Homes for Horses Coalition leadership is very aware of how devastating any disaster can be for people who are the guardians of horses. This webinar is structured to help you be prepared to protect your equines in some ways that you may never have considered for whatever may come your way. I'm gonna tell you a bit about our three presenters and we'll turn them, then we'll turn the mic over to our first presenter, Julie Atwood, who will also co-moderate the sessions with me. We asked Julie, who's one of the best collectors and dispatchers of emergency and disaster resources we know of to organize a webinar on emergency preparedness. She has delivered beyond our expectations inviting two additional presenters to join her here today. First, I'd like to tell you a bit about Dr. John Madigan. Dr. Madigan earned his veterinary degree at UC Davis, then practiced as a veterinarian in private practice until joining the UC Davis faculty as both a teacher and researcher for almost four decades. He has spent his career devoted to research, discovery of disorders and diseases affecting large animals and developing equipment and methods for animal rescue while expanding the field of veterinary disaster medicine. Dr. Madigan founded the highly acclaimed UC Davis Veterinary Emergency Response Team, also known as VERT or VERT, 
He was instrumental in the development of the UC Davis Anderson sling and the UC Davis large animal lift, equipment used widely in emergency medicine and large animal rescue. He has actively engaged in rescue operations for animals caught in natural disasters such as floods and fires, and has been the driving force behind the VERT team, a group of voluntary faculty, staff, and students who assist with animal rescue and veterinary care during disasters. One of Dr. Madison's rescues even involved the challenge of rescuing a cow from a mine shaft. <laughs> he has held multiple leadership positions, including head of the equine neonatal intensive care program, chief of the equine medicine service, associate director of the large animal clinic at the William R. Pritchard Veterinary Medical and Teaching Hospital, director of the International Animal Welfare Training Institute and liaison in disaster response with local and state emergency response agencies, including large animal helicopter rescue teams. Dr. Madigan has published more than 160 scientific papers. He's received numerous prestigious awards throughout his career. To share just a few, He's been awarded the Pfizer Award for Research Excellence, the Red Cross Hero Award, the AAEP Distinguished Service Award, and the U.S. Congressional Achievement Recognition Award, and the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine Alumni Achievement Award, the school's highest honor. Dr. Madigan is a coveted speaker internationally on multiple topics including the ones he will cover with us today. Also with us today is Dr. Rebecca McConico. Dr. McConico is a professor of agricultural sciences and animal science and a veterinarian at Louisiana Tech University in Ruston, Louisiana. And she's a board and is board certified by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Dr. McConico was the founding director of the Louisiana State University School of Veterinary Medicine's Veterinary Disaster Response and Training Program, which she is now continuing at Louisiana Tech University in Reston, Louisiana. Dr. McConico has coordinated trainings and presented at multiple veterinary schools and at local, state, national, and global conferences on disaster response emphasizing the importance of collaboration between human and animal response. She believes that veterinarians play a vital role in building community risk reduction as it relates to all hazards disaster response. She's a highly experienced university professor, veterinar veterinarian, and researcher and has published numerous articles on large animal and equine internal medicine, on emergency preparedness, and the treatment of conditions and injuries typical to equine victims of disasters. She's considered one of the country's foremost experts in treating conditions that occur in equines in areas like the Gulf and Eastern coastal states where hurricanes, floods, and other disasters present unique challenges for horse owners. Julie Atwood will be our first presenter. Judy Solomon Atwood has lived in rural Sonoma County, California for most of her life and is a lifelong horsewoman. In 2013, an emergency involving one of her ranch horses motivated her to develop local resources for helping animals in emergencies. What started as a small local project to help first responders acquire better animal technical rescue skills evolved into the Train the Trainer program that now reaches over the entire state. In 2014, the Halter Project, which was founded by Julie, added community preparedness education to its toolkit filling a great need for information and resources for animals and residents of rural areas. As a result, first responders in every service, equine managers, veterinarians, 
rural residents, and numerous non-governmental organizations are working together better to foster collaboration in emergencies and regional disasters. Halter Project contributes more than 8,000 volunteer hours each year to local agencies and programs and provides several dozen training scholarships for first responders annually. Julie was recognized by the California Emergency Management Agency for her volunteer disaster work and was a guest speaker at the International Conference on Animals in Disasters. She has produced four yearly home and ranch readiness symposium events, some of which have been televised nationally in a feature documentary. In 2016, the Halter Project was invited to the White House as a recipient of two FEMA Individual and Community Preparedness Awards. The Halter Project supports programs helping animals and communities prepare for and and recover from disasters throughout the world. It is truly an honor to have these three experts with us, uh, with us today to teach us how to be prepared for natural disasters and major equine related emergencies. I'll turn the mic over to Julie Atwood now, who will provide a broad view of emergency and disaster preparedness and what being prepared really means. Thank you, Julie. Wow, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, AWI and the Hor Homes for Horses Coalition for inviting me. And thanks to all of you who are joining in and those of you who will join us in the future on the recorded event. I wanted to do a little bit of quick housekeeping. Dr. McConaughey is having some technical difficulties. <laughs> it's kind of the way our world runs these days, right? And so we're gonna have a slight change I will be first, and then I'm going to invite Dr. Matt again to follow me, and we're going to give Dr. McConaughey a little bit of extra time, so she will be last. Hopefully, we'll have all her uh, communication glitches sorted out by then. So, hi and welcome. If I were facing all of you in a room, the very first thing I do would be to ask everybody raise their hands if you feel that you are prepared for whatever is happening in your area. We've got blizzards, we've got tornadoes, we've got floods, debris flows, you name it, we've got it going on in North America. And so that means that most of you somewhere might have to uh, be thinking about that. So since I can't see you raise your hands, I'm just gonna ask you to take a deep breath and do a quick you know, mental check-in. Are you ready for whatever nature or circumstances might throw at you today? If you cannot answer in all truthfulness, yes, I am ready, then we're gonna, we're gonna help you. So uh, as I said, this is a very, or as I, as I wanted to tell you, I'm gonna talk very fast, um, giving myself a short time so that I could give more space to these incredible veterinarians we have. I'm available pretty much to all of you anytime. Anytime you wanna have a workshop or a chat, just get in touch with me at halterproject.org. All our information is on our slides. I'm gonna run through my slides very quickly. At the end, we're going to give you some excellent resources. Don't panic. Everything that we talk about today is going to be available to you in an awesome link that you will be able to find at our website, halterproject.org. And it is a special folder full of incredible resources that we have compiled, especially for you, the equine rescue and sanctuary owners in this country. So I wanna start by saying that you are all incredible people. You are committed, you're compassionate, you are dedicated. And we know that you want absolutely the best for all the animals in your care. Unfortunately, that usually means that you're putting all of your energy and your resources into the day-to-day -day care, getting the animals, saving the animals, and taking care of the animals. Also, just by nature of the beast, a lot of rescues and sanctuaries, because they need a lot of space, they're occupying locations that are the cheapest property in the area. Not always, but frequently. Unfortunately, that means that you may also be right in, the, in harm's way. You, you may be in areas that are more vulnerable to the things that are most common in your area, which means you have to be triply 
aware. Sadly, in many of our disasters, what we find is that the people who are yelling the loudest and the hardest and most frantically for help are some of our rescues and sanctuaries. They just have too many animals to uh, transport. They have no place to go. They don't have the resources and they waited too long. Not calling anybody out, it's just the way it is. We also have lots and lots of wonderful rescues and sanctuaries who are super community partners. They're the first to raise their hands and volunteer space or trailers or helpers. It works both ways. Our goal is to help every single one of you be as safe and prepared to care for your animals in emergencies and disasters and take it a step further and become valued community resources. So are you ready? Here we go. Shiloh, next slide. This is just a little bit about us. I'm not gonna take the time to read through it. Elaine already said way, way, way more, but we did start in 2013 and we're here to help our communities focusing on the animal owners be safe and ready. Next slide, please. Yoo-hoo, <laughs> here we are. Oops, wrong direction. Don't you love Zoom, everybody? Okay, so I've given myself about 15 minutes and I've already run through a few of them. I am going to speak quickly. We're gonna to touch very, very briefly on the differences between emergencies and disasters and why that is important. How to develop your emergency and disaster action plans. How to assess or how to go about assessing your risks and needs. Developing your network of resources, really important. And why you should know about animal technical rescue or large animal rescue, what that means to you. At the very end, again, we're gonna give you super resources and all of it's gonna be available to you after this presentation. Okay, next slide. Emergencies and disasters, do you know the difference? Okay, very briefly, again, if I were with you, I would ask you, but an emergency happens to you. It's an individual occurrence. It is uh, relatively small, although it may seem big to you in the moment. It happens in just one location, might be just one or a few animals, one or a few people. It's small. What's the difference between an emergency and a disaster? A disaster is big. It is going to affect a lot of people, a lot of animals, and probably a very large area. Why is this important? Because how you plan for an emergency is different from how you plan for a disaster. Who will help you in each of those incidents is different. How do you plan and prepare? We're going to help you. And within the context of this, why is large animal rescue or animal technical rescue important? Well, it's important because that is or should be a really big part of your planning and preparedness for everyday emergencies and possibly in disasters as well. In an emergency, you're gonna know who to call, they're gonna be able to get to you quickly, and hopefully the situation is going to be resolved in a, it, with a happy ending in a short time. In a disaster, help may not be able to get to you for hours or even days. You need to be self-reliant, you need to know how to help yourself, and you need to have have a list of resources that you can call and count on immediately to get help to you. Your staff needs to be trained, your family needs to be prepared. So it's much bigger, but the takeaway for you as rescue and sanctuary owners is that in an emergency, you're gonna have help in a disaster, you need to be your own best helper. Okay, next slide. This, for, this, this workshop is all about preparing emergency and disaster plans. So how do you get started? It really seems daunting. And what I am asked over and over again is, what do I do first? I don't know where to start. There's so much material. Well, we're trying to break it down and make it easy for you. The very first step is to sit down and take a hard look at your risks. What are you most vulnerable to? what can possibly happen. You really, really need to be realistic, okay? Really, really realistic, <laughs> very redundant. 
a lot of people think this is very stressful. Yeah, it is. You, you have to take a deep breath and you have to think hard and clearly about every possible thing that can happen. Is it gonna bring your heart rate up while you're doing it? Yes. Is it going to help you immeasurably when you need to be prepared? Absolutely. And could it save you lots and lots of heartbreak downstream? Definitely. So it's really important. And one of the tools that we're providing you with the uh, resources is a self-assessment quiz. So you can start out by asking yourself questions, answering, nobody's going to judge you. <laughs> it's not a test. Um, questions that are part of assessing your risks. Uh, what could happen? How long will it take emergency services to get to me? How long would it take to move all the animals to a safe place? How long will it take me to evacuate? How long will your power and your supplies last? And how long can you care for the people and the animals without outside help? And repeatedly in my presentation, you're gonna hear me say the animals and the people, the people and the animals. And that is because although we are all united here today because we love and are committed to caring for animals in emergency and disaster, Disaster response, humans are always going to come first. Why is it so important for us animal owners to have plans so that we can take care of ourselves and we can take care of our animals so that we're not putting responders at risk, so that they don't have to risk their lives and extra resources trying to get us out of harm's way because we're staying back because our animals are in harm's way. So there's definitely a hierarchy and we can, to a very great extent, control that. Okay, next slide. Once you have assessed your risks, now you need to identify your needs, fill those gaps. When you assess your risks, you will realize what you don't have or what you might need to do, okay? So step one, assess your risks. Step two, identify your needs. Once you get through this part, you're about halfway through having a great plan. So infrastructure security. I put this one first for, for rescue and sanctuary owners because this is really what it boils down to. We know that many of you will not have mass evacuation as plan A, because you simply have too many animals, you have no way to transport enough of them, or there may simply be no place to go. So that's why your rescue, your refuge, your sanctuary, it should really meet all the criteria for those words. Is your sanctuary space really a safe refuge? So, so my, my plea to all of you would be to do everything you can to make your property the safest possible refuge for your animals. So look at your infrastructure. Do you have the ability to safely shelter your animals in place? If not, then evacuation has got to be your plan A and you're gonna have to spend a lot of time developing lots of resources to make that possible. Do you have water, food, shelter, communication plans, medical and veterinary supplies? And can you care for the people and the animals on site for an extended period? Do you have signage and access tools so that first responders can get into your property to help you and your animals? If evacuation is your plan A, do you know the evacuation routes? Do you have adequate transportation? And do you have multiple temporary shelter locations? where you can accommodate all of your animals and if necessary, family and staff as well. Is your staff trained? Does everybody who is involved with the care of the animals in your care know what to do and do they know how to do someone else's job? Really important. Your helper's resources. So how many of you remember Mr. Rogers thanking the helpers? Well, we always love to invoke Mr. Rogers because calms us down and makes us smile, right? But helpers is really the term that says it all. Agencies will use all kinds of fancy terms for resources, but what it boils down to is who is gonna help you? How do you help yourselves? Who are, the, who are you gonna call, okay? So who can you get? And again, it's really important to always have 
more than one or two or even three of everything because the first or second or third resource you call might not be avail available. They may need help also. So you have to have multiples of everything. Everything that's on this list, you have to have backup for. Got it? Next slide, please. How do you identify and develop your resources? Well, it depends a lot on where you live. And again, one of the points I wanna make in this presentation, because we have a huge audience and you guys are all over North America, right? So there is not going to be a one size fits all. I can't tell you exactly what agency or what organization to contact in your area. This is where you have to step up and do some homework, but we're gonna give you the cheat sheets. We're gonna give you the cues. So identifying and developing your personal network of resources. So this is in addition to, you know, who would come if you call 911. In an emergency, you can call 911, you can call the vet, you can call your next door neighbor, you can call someone who works for you. They're gonna be able to get to you within a, a relatively fast period of time. In a disaster, you're not going to be able to do that, okay? Often emergency services will tell us, do not call 911 unless it is a life-threatening situation. And again, they're not going to be referring to animal lives, they're referring to human lives. If human lives are threatened in an ongoing disaster, you can call 911, but you may not get through because those lines are clogged. So in a disaster, self-reliance is the single most important tool you can develop. So develop and update your own network of resources for absolutely every kind of help you'll need. Contact local and regional emergency and disaster preparedness resources. Examples of these will be your County Office of Emergency Services, the Department of Agriculture, NACI. NACI, you can, don't ask me to spell it out for you, but that is our national organization that develops best practices for the care and sheltering of animals in disasters. Great website, lots of resources. Local veterinary colleges. We're so lucky today, we've got two rock star vets with us who are both affiliated or have been affiliated with major teaching institutions. Um, your Ag Extension Service. Your local ag advisor can be your best friend. The cooperative extension websites in most states, especially agricultural states, is a wealth of information. Find out who the extension service resources are in your area, get to know them, make sure they're in your speed dial contacts. Your animal control agency. Many of you who operate rescues are already best friends with animal control in your area because you are often the go-to resource for that agency when they are um, handling animals who are uh, welfare cases, and you may frequently be taking in animals on their behalf. But if you're not in a good relationship with animal control, change that because in a disaster, most often your county or city animal control or animal services agency is the authority with the jurisdiction over all the animals, okay? So make sure that you know who they are, who to call, and if possible, develop a really great relationship. Um, last but not least, a CART. CART is Community Animal Response Team. We also have SARTs for state response teams and DARTs for National FEMA Certified Animal Response Teams. So these are resources who are already trained and they're authorized by jurisdictions, usually by county or by city and sometimes by a larger region to work with agencies and emergency managers like the firefighters, like search and rescue, like sheriff or police in declared disasters and sometimes local emergencies. Most often these resources cannot self-deploy. I'm on five carts. Can I just jump up the minute there is a disaster and volunteer myself? No, we work within the incident command system and we have to wait until we are officially asked to be on standby and be ready and then activated to deploy. But if there is a cart in your area, my first suggestion would be to join it and train with them 
And if that for some reason isn't possible, then get to know them and get to know people in the cart so that you know how they operate and who to call. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna break away for a second and talk about animal technical rescue. Also often referred to as large animal rescue or technical large animal emergency rescue. All those terms mean exactly the same thing. What is it? It is essentially standard search and rescue skills that have been modified for heavy animals. So using um, basic rope rescue techniques, rescue straps, slides, stretchers, things like that, that have all been modified so that they can safely accommodate large heavy animals. Why is this important to you? Because as rescue owners, you probably have lots of geriatric animals with creaky joints who sometimes can't get up easily or at all on cold mornings. Every horse owner has known some equine who was the smartest horse in the world, but it manages to get itself cast in a fence, in its skull, in a paddock, um, on the, the three foot hillside that's the only rise for five miles. Stuff happens, animals get stuck, they need a little help. In my humble opinion, every rescue facility owner and your staff should possess basic technical rescue skills and you should have basic inexpensive equipment that's gonna enable you to help your own animals out of a situation, be able to assess them, be able to convey information accurately to the vet and be able to help the vet. In disasters, usually a technical rescue team will be called to assist animals. And this is most prevalent in our um, areas that flood. Out here in the West, when we're dealing with a fire, our technical rescue teams are human search and rescue and technical rescue teams are gonna be busy helping people. So the carts often have the large animal technical rescue skills, and they will be the resources that help animals who not only need evacuating, but they may be down and can't get up. They may assist the veterinary teams and help get animals loaded into trailers for transportation, things like that. But why is it important for you to know this? Because you can be your own best helper. How do you do it? lots and lots of ways to train. Again, go to our resources and we provided a dedicated resource slide for large animal rescue resources for training, for online education and for equipment. Next slide, please. Help resources. Why do I keep going back to this? Because again, these are the single most important pieces of information and resources you're going to develop. How do you go about doing that? emergencies, your helpers in an emergency are going to be your staff, your family, your neighbors, um, a local animal rescue, technical rescue team. And gee, wouldn't it be great if you are that technical rescue team? Uh, your local fire department, of course, your veterinarians, possibly heavy equipment operators. You might need a tractor or a backhoe or a boom truck. So that's a local emergency. You're gonna get on the phone, you're gonna call those people and you're gonna have all the help you need in a very short period of time because there's nothing else going on. In a disaster, everything changes. In a disaster, the types of resources you need to have in your little address book, in your phone, in your computer, in a binder and a file that is copied and available in multiple locations. And what's that going to include? It's going to include people who can help you if you're sheltering in place, starting with you and your staff. Locations for temporary board or shelter, your veterinarians, your animal control or animal welfare agencies and organizations who are working with the local emergency managers in a disaster equestrian clubs, rodeo associations, horse councils. All of those are great resources for people who are competent horse haulers. They've got good trucks and trailers. They know how to handle animals and they generally really wanna help. Keep in mind that once an evacuation order has been issued, and we're gonna go into this a little bit further, many of the resources in your call list may not or cannot get to you 
only those resources who are authorized to work with emergency services will be able to help you out. But before that, when it's still voluntary or if you are sheltered in place, these are all the people that you need to be able to try to have available. So your Ag Extension Service, once again, and let's not forget Fleet of Angels. Fleet of Angels is the single largest national provider of emergency transportation, feed, and other kinds of relief for equines. Thank you, Fleet of Angels and Elaine Nash. Next slide, please. Technical rescue. When does it happen? Well, it's less frequently, but if you are a rescue owner, it probably happens to you more frequently than it does to a lot of others. Um, you need to have technical rescue skills in a transportation accident. Uh, when animals fall over the edge, you're gonna need to call on that technical rescue team. Um, structure collapse, like a tornado or an earthquake. Animals that fall through the ice or they're stuck in the mud or deep or swift moving floodwaters. This is when you are not going to be able, most likely, to handle that rescue on your own. You're gonna need to call 911 ask for the technical rescue team in a large scale disaster, those resources may already be deployed. If you and your staff are on site and you have the basic skills, you're gonna be well positioned to help those responders. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, who responds? Actually, I, I got ahead of myself. So I just ran through this with you. And again, if you wanna uh, take longer with this, it's all in our resources, but who responds? Essentially you, if it's a local emergency and you and your staff are trained and you have the basic skills and equipment in a larger incident, it's going to be local resources who have more advanced skills and they've got all the bells and whistles equipment. Next slide, please. Make a plan for everything. I've said this already a couple of times. Why? Because we can't say it enough. One plan is not enough. You've got to have plan A, plan B, plan C, and possibly D and E. If you plan for everything that can go wrong, you'll have a fallback. I am a person who actually has lived that fully. We live in a place that was overrun by fire in 2017. We actually have a video in our resources in which we recount that story. If I had not had multiple plans and if I hadn't had some prior training, I'm not convinced I would have been able to save myself, all my animals, uh, my home, and my family and my workers. But we did because we were ready. Our plan A was already out the door. Our plan B was marginal. We really implemented our plan C, which was actually an earthquake plan. And we sheltered in place with our animals and we wrote everything out safely. Review your plan and your site map with your local fire department. Consult with your local fire and emergency services, include them. I cannot stress enough the importance of collaborating with your local emergency services. Make a communication plan. This is where a lot of plans fall apart for individuals as well as for agencies and big regions. Communications are the most fragile link in any disaster. So you've got to have as many ways to stay connected as you possibly can. And again, we're going to include resources and information about that. Next slide, please. Every disaster action plan or DAP as we call them in the trade should include first aid instructions or, and again, these are specific to you as equine rescue and sanctuary owners. First aid, that's for you and your animals large animal rescue information and instructions, emergency contacts, resource contacts, a site map and access information for responders, animal care directives. Nobody wants to think about it, but you must. How do you want your animals cared for and if possible euthanized should things come to that point? That's also part of your everyday plan. In case you're not around, you wanna make sure that your animals are cared for the way you want them to and that your wishes and your directives are carried out. You've got to have a written document for that. Animal identification. This is a huge topic. There's lots of information on it. We've given you lots of tools and our resources, but if your animals are scattered 
or if your animals are evacuated by others and they end up in shelters, you want to be able to reconnect with them as quickly as possible. So identification, ways to manage identification, not just physically on your animals, but in records as well, in your record keeping, really important. A plan for biosafety and health. It's getting increasingly important. Not just biosafety and health concerns for humans, but biosafety and health concerns for the animals. Stressed animals are much more likely to get sick. Our vets are gonna talk about this in their presentation. Um, moving animals from place to place without proper protocols in place is one of the biggest challenges that we face in disaster management. Understand where the vulnerabilities are, what the dangers are in your area, and understand how to keep everybody healthy. Next slide, please. Know how to get information. This is huge. Do you know how to get emergency alerts in your area? Do you know how to get help? Who to call for help and the kind of help that's available? Again, all of this info is available in our resources slides. Uh, very quickly, I just wanna talk about the type of help you can get. Do you know that you can ask for welfare checks through emergency services? If you can't get to your animals, if your animals are stranded, do you know how to get an escort if it's available to help you get into your property? Do you know who can evacuate your animals inside a mandatory evacuation zone? And do you know how to get disaster relief and financial aid? These are all very critical parts of your plan, knowing where to get the information and how to get the resources you need should be part of your plan. Next slide, please. Hey, we got there. We did it. Take a deep breath, keep calm and be ready. So normally when I run these programs, I start out by saying breathe and I remind everyone, including myself to breathe every few minutes. But in any emergency or disaster, the very first thing I want all of you to train yourselves to do is stop, take several deep breaths and focus because if you're not calm, your animals won't be calm. If you're not safe and focused, you cannot lead others. So this is our mantra, keep calm and be ready for whatever. Thanks for listening. I'm gonna give you a quick, quick look at our resource slides. This slide gives you a little taste of what's included. All of this information is available on a great link at our website, halterproject.org, in a special folder we've created for you, the Equine Sanctuary and Rescue Owners. Thanks so much for joining us. And now I'm gonna hand it over to my good friend, Dr. John Madigan. Take it away, Dr. John. Yeah, is that showing up okay? Can people hear me all right? I get any Looking feedback? good, Dr. J. Pardon me? Sounding good to you. Okay, uh, and uh, the slide is okay. Just getting feedback. Think we're all good. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I've uh, relocated. Uh, speaking of emergency things, you have to be flexible. Uh, a fuse blew in the, a room I was in uh, previously with the storms we're having. And uh, so I'm in uh, another part of the barn here, but uh, we're out because uh, I'm uh, a lot like you folks. We uh, live with the horses and uh, have them at our home. And uh, we've been uh, uh, dealing with some storms and other issues here. So uh, really uh, appreciate being able to speak to uh, the group that's responsible for so many important aspects of caring for horses. That's the sanctuary owners and uh, the devotion that's there. And it, uh, when we get add the emergency details to the everyday operation, it certainly can seem overwhelming uh, I, I'm going to guess uh, as you uh, get the uh, all the options that are available to you and, 
and, and uh, whatnot. But we're, I think uh, knowing where the resources are is a, good, a really good first start. So I've asked to talk about some issues that uh, affect horses and fires. And I'm gonna see if I can advance my slides. That's the, the next trick here uh, for me, because it's not, let's see here, okay. Like uh, most of the preparations that we've done, they work really great when uh, uh, no one's here, but uh, let's see, there must be some other thing there. Sorry about that. There we go. So for us, uh, you know, I'm gonna be talking about two things here, stable fires and wildfires. And uh, the wildfires is the new normal uh, globally and certainly here in California. And I realize our audience is much wider than that, but as we look at the news, uh, the, this risk factor is uh, quite diffuse. So uh, we're in, uh, you may be in the same thing with large areas that uh, can be affected by these uh, mega fires as we've seen in Australia, California, Texas, uh, uh, Oklahoma, all kinds of places. And uh, it's a new challenge to horse owners and those of us that provide veterinary care. Uh, it's a new ball game. It's a, a um, people that have been in the fire service for many, many years are not used to these firestorms. They're not used to the, uh, how fast the fire spread. So what does that mean to you as a sanctuary horse owner? That means that uh, there may be a risk of a fire uh, quite a ways away and with the embers and these uh, the way the fire moves uh it it can rapidly approach and so there's lots of midnight evacuations and other things going on uh despite uh, everyone's best attention intention so what that means is evacuation orders are going to be issued in larger areas as part of their routine and that's going to mean that you're going to have a hard time getting into those areas uh, uh, when there's an evacuation order in place and you're trying to go in to move animals or what have you. And then uh, we don't have that much education or training uh, throughout veterinary curriculums. We, uh, UC Davis, uh, that's uh, not true. Uh, and other schools, a few other schools as well. So we have um, a unique curriculum uh, with uh, several hundred students that take this as a volunteer part of their education. So uh, the stable fires, uh, that's uh, you know, a big issue as well. Uh, that's one that's uh, historically been here a lot longer than these ra rapidly moving mega fires. And uh, we have some of the issues that are there that I've listed are access to uh, the area where there is a stable fire, uh, the need for triage uh, at the site uh, by someone that's familiar with uh, what animals can stay where they are, which ones need additional care. Uh, then, of course, I'll talk a little bit about burns, not that you're going to be treating burns, but it's good to be aware of what you're starting with. The horse on the right there was in a stable fire in, uh, uh, at, uh, in a facility here in Yolo County a few years ago. Uh, we have smoke inhalation issues, and that can be uh, those that are close by uh, the fire, actually, you know, in the zone, if you will. And then, it, then as we know, the uh, air pollution index uh, have been really big uh, and diffuse, and they affect uh, uh, people, and there's guidelines. And I can just tell you that uh, when you're talking about exercising horses or moving horses, just follow the same restrictions that are present for reduced activity and uh, air quality indexes for humans, they're very applicable for horses. And our horses can't always go inside, but we can limit uh, the amount of exercise they have to do and the amount of breathing that they have to do and uh, try to set up the best uh, uh, conditions for uh, air quality. And then when horses are trying to uh, flee, get away from the fire, uh, or, and I'll talk about sometimes horses get turned loose, uh, we get flight related injuries uh, as well. So when we think of fires, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is, gee, horses getting burned and uh, 
that's just the actually a small part of the wildfire uh, health risk to horses. So I've listed what the other issues are here. I will cover burns, they're important. But uh, smoke issues, I'll get to in a second. And then evacuation associated health issues, meaning that uh, you may have limited access to areas under mandatory evacuation. Uh, there may be no recognition of a veterinarian as a first responder in time critical situations. Uh, there is uh, 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 injuries that can occur uh, when horses are trying to be evacuated. I'll get into that loading, uh, unloading uh, many times uh, in adverse conditions in the night, et cetera. Uh, sheltering issues uh, are part that can affect the health when we bring horses in. Uh, we'll talk about that. We have a lot of biosecurity things, a lot of horses housed together that aren't used to being together. Uh, there's a bit of chaos during the fire and smoke as you uh, initially try to make a uh, decision about haltering animals or moving them to safety and uh, can be very chaotic and it can uh, uh, lead to risk to horses that get loose, uh, spook, run over people or injure themselves. Then we have the need for in the field setting by uh, folks that have experience to, to set up triage. And uh, one of those is, uh, is identifying horses that have absolutely no chance of recovery. I won't get into that in great detail other than to say, if, there's, if someone is not sure, get an opinion from those that have a little more experience, provide some immediate pain relief, had set up some transportation and have a look. And then with the ability for FaceTime and other things, if the uh, internet system is up, we do a lot of consulting in the field saying, what, do you, what chance do you think this animal has? And they'll show us some things with the feet and the, and the extent of burns, uh, first degree, second degree, third degrees, things like that. And we can make uh, some suggestions to them right at the time. Then escape injuries, uh, we know. <laughs> Uh, you don't need a fire to have escape injuries. Horses get through a gate that's been left open or you get the, uh, the pickpocket horse. Uh, you know, there was one video of a pony that could, you know, look like a safe cracker on the internet. He could open any gate. So you do have that. And then when the horse get loose, as we know, they can injure themselves. And then the loose animals in public places, that's going to be at, uh, uh, a factor. Uh, uh, as animals are fleeing uh, the fire, just like uh, deer, wildlife, and other animals, they'll get out of their comfort zone or where they're safe and try to get away. And then human injuries are a big part of this. And uh, there's been some significant injuries with people trying to evacuate horses and uh, uh, serious uh, brain uh, and uh, other injuries from falls and uh, getting trampled and whatnot. So we have to be aware of that. And then, of course, that brings up just besides, you know, the health aspects and uh, human suffering, but the liability issues as well. So to get into the smoke uh, discussion a little bit, uh, the effect, I'll just talk secondary smoke related air quality issues in areas adjacent to fires where the smoke has gotten into the environment is affecting people and animals. So. That, that's going to be your air quality index and follow that. And uh, just a suggestion for those of you that are riders or doing x-rays that realize in the sanctuary, a lot of the horses are there uh, just to be housed, but there's also programs and other things. Well, we want to curtail those when the air quality is bad. And then it, we consider that when there has been a pretty significant exposure, it takes about 14 days based on the human studies and so a little bit of actually uh, human excuse me, equine uh, pulmonary studies with bronchoalveolar lavages and things like that and horses exposed to smoke. It takes about two weeks for the lungs to recover if you've had a, a smoke you know, insult. You also have smoke inhalation. Uh, that's the immediate association that can produce thermal injury from hot gases and the toxic effects of the smoke components. So how do you tell you can't look into the respiratory tract, but often these horses show evidence of thermal skin injury, meaning their face and eyes and that area are, are burned because sometimes lowland wildland fires, it's just the hooves and the lower limbs. And then others, uh, it, it's going to affect the uh, upper respiratory tract and then they can be breathing in these hot gases. 
So that's very frequent in uh, stable fires and less frequent in the wildland fires because of the diffuse uh, air and that you know, horses that get trapped like that and they're in that close, sometimes they don't make it. And uh, they, uh, they're consumed by the fire. And, uh, and, uh, but some do have the, uh, significant pulmonary issues and you'll need veterinary care for that. That's not an emergency thing that you can do something about right away. It's, uh, it's making an assessment then moving ahead. So I, I'm not going to spend too much time other than give you, a, I, I guess, the awareness level of, uh, of this thing with the burns in horses, because uh, people say, I'd like to bring a horse to the sanctuary that's had burns. And that can be a real significant challenge, depending on the magnitude of the, uh, of the burns. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview and uh, then get on to some of those other issues too. But uh, what areas can be burned? Well, it can be skin, of course, uh, the cornea, the eyes, uh, uh, the outer surface of the eye, the cornea, lids. Some horses, well, their lids will be so swollen, and the same with our food animals and whatnot. You can't see the eyes, and you can make an assumption that there's damage to the globe itself, but it's actually not. It's the uh, conjunctiva is swollen so much in, uh, that you can't see the inner eye. Uh, and then hooves are a big issue. Uh, you can stand some uh, changes to the hooves. Uh, there's a few papers on that. But if the hoof is detached, as uh, we've actually seen in some of these because of the thermal injury and the, and the hoof capsule is actually just floating on the end of the foot, that's, uh, that's a terminal injury. Then you have to assess those in between that. Uh, to see if the, uh, the coronary band has had enough thermal damage that it won't have the ability to grow in the future. And that takes some experience and, uh, and often some tincture of time to uh, observe. So we get asked, what can we do if we come up on a horse that, that's been burned? Well, a lot of times the skin is still uh, so hot if you're there right away that we do want to cool the area with water or damp towels for 10 minutes just to get that temperature of the skin down and even once a heat is removed further tissue may burn because it can be very deep uh, heat any halters that they're wearing or anything you want to replace the halter not just take it off but obviously put on another halter that doesn't have uh, melted plastic and if they're wearing a blanket there may they, they that it's good to get those off and for deeper wounds we avoid the ice in uh, a, a lot of extensive cold water uh, because we don't want to go to that extreme and get vaso what we call vasoconstriction okay so it's something to be aware of is that burns are are uh, long term uh, depending on the degree and I'll, I'll briefly mention that but in a study, the Boo Woolsey, uh, Elizabeth Woolsey, uh, her nickname I, I'm using there, uh, Australian veterinarian, a friend of ours, uh, uh, took in a number of horses and then charted their course of therapy, and they need teams of people. And it was about $10,000 in just expenses, not her time uh, to care for those horses. So it's long term and it's expensive, and that's good to be aware of when you get approached about possibly caring for these things. A team is needed to care for each horse because there's debridement. Uh, when we get horses referred in, they've got severe burns. Uh, they can spend one to two hours per day per horse uh, providing the care that's needed. I tell people get on the GoFundMe uh, for that particular horse if you're going to do that because you're going to need some other monies in your budget. These are not going to be expected or planned expenses and, and um, Detailing that, that that's worked and I suggest that for Dr. Woolsey and she was able to recoup funds for that. And then it's often good to, to check into referring to a place where you already have donated funds and you have teams of people because this can really change your operation if you've got one or two burned horses. And uh, I've got a reference here and I know uh, Julie has got that on her website as well, that uh, uh, Elizabeth Woolsey paper. Let's see. Uh, so how deep is the burn and how extensive? So we go by this grading system. I'm going to just go through this quickly just to let you know it's important to get that assessment because when you say, oh, the horse is burned, 
Uh, how's it going to turn out? Well, it all depends on whether it's first, second, or third degree or fourth degree burns in. So the, we do a physical exam, look on the head and uh, the back of the horse like we see there. And it's really hard to tell the depth and degree on an initial evaluation, even if you've had a lot of experience. Sometimes you need a few days when you're providing symptomatic relief. It may not be uh, apparent for 48 hours. Corneal damage may be present. You may uh, need some uh, eye care there, respiratory tract. How are you gonna do that? You're gonna look, are they breathing fast? Is it labored? Is there a cough? Those are suggestions that you have had significant smoke inhalation or actual hot thermal gases burning uh, inside the lung and producing some damage. And of course the hooves. So the first degree that's uh, superficial involves the outer dermis, uh, epidermis that's uh, upon the dermis. And these are red, they're not blistered and the heat heal quickly without scarring. And they can be real painful so pain is, is a great masquerader in this thing because deeper uh, burns, you burn the pain receptors and you can be walking around on a hoof that is actually detached and the horse doesn't know it. So, and then first degree burns, ow, you know, really sore. So, but not as deep and they heal better. So we gotta make sure we understand that. Uh, superficial second degree burns, the uh, top of the dermis, then uh, deep second degree burns, uh, then, uh, sorry, third degree burns, these, uh, sorry for the pictures here, but that's what it is. They, they get under the skin into the sub Q. And then I didn't put this picture up, I moved it out, fourth degree burns, it's down to muscle bone connective tissue. So healing time, first degree, rapid second degree, 14 to 17 days, then you get into the three to four weeks, then the third and fourth degree are weeks to months. So need an assessment of the magnitude and also the extent that the horses are burned. So there's a horse with some crusty things after a, for a that's a second degree burn and third degree uh, on, the, on the dorsum. And then you see this uh, a nice sorrel horse there with the eyes uh, injured and around the nose. So, if you're greater than 50% of the surface area, it's uh, not good. The complications are, are many, laminitis, kidney problems, infection. So for those of you that wanna just read about how things happen there, it's uh, free online uh, by Elizabeth uh, Herbert is her uh, formal name, uh, Woolsey. And uh, that reference is uh, with Julie. So moving along with uh, health issues that affect horses and fires, uh, horses left behind when an area evacuated can be injured. You see those two horses there, look at all the stuff they can wander into. And then the fences are terrible. They got wire there, you got you know nails and all kinds of things there. So uh, horses, I, I keep getting texts from uh, somebody here. I hope it's not, uh, uh, I don't know what why I'm getting them, Julie. You're fine. Sending, you're fine, Doctor John. I think we just had a delay. You're fine. You're good. Okay. Well, I've got a uh, hall monitor here. I'm, I th that's good because I can uh, wander off sometimes. So uh, we can be they they can be without food and water for periods because owners are prevented from returning to the area. And then this uh, this uh, uh, donkey there. Uh, so, you know, he's uh, hopefully not going to get hit by fire equipment and things like that, but roadside, roadway accidents, uh, really important. So those are just as important as burns. And uh, the sooner we get to those horses, uh, part of my emergency kit is grain and a bucket and pellets or whatever to make some noise, because that's how we caught those two horses. I took that picture there. And they couldn't wait to get in the trailer. It was interesting. They said, oh, gosh, I hope they load. OK, well, they about knocked us over. I guess they, they said, we, we're not staying in this place you know, any longer than we have to. So that was good. So uh, these occur when the horses are fleeing. And you see sometimes it's when fire, first responders show up. And uh, you see the horse running because they're setting a backfire. There's a lot of noise <clears throat> and other things. And that is a. Uh, 
uh, that can produce uh, that horse trying to jump out of that field or being hard to catch. So if we know first responders coming in, if we can move the horses out of the visual and, uh, and sound thing, uh, going to be very important in preventing injury to the horses. So when we're out in the field, uh, we don't, you know, right at the site, we try to set up a triage area. It can be a fairgrounds or some other place. And then people converge there with skills and different organizations. And that's some of our veterinary students that uh, if you, you can't see closely, but there's a, the person in the dark blues, that's using a pitchfork to hold up the uh, IV fluids that that horse needed initially because it was deprived food and water for a period of time and uh, was getting some care. And that's one of our VERT students there. So get to the triage area where you have teams. That means transport, that means access. And uh, then they can do some triage for you. Uh, there's no expenses associated with this. Uh, donations often cover the entire thing. So it, it makes sense to take advantage of that. I'm gonna show you a little video that just shows some aspect. Uh, this is a uh, pod where you store hay. So when horses are sheltered in place, you can stay there. So here's a triage. It happens to be a cat, but that could be a horse. Um, a Minecraft. That cat is found and has severe burns and needs to go somewhere where there's veterinary care at an advanced level and make an assessment on that. Then here's a horse that's been left behind uh, and he's got a fence post that's punctured him when he tried to jump out. And then I'm giving him some hay and you can see I'm violating one of the rules is that uh, feed them small amounts first, but you feel so bad uh, that you can uh, give them too much hay right away. So gradually do it. Then you get to the triage area. See, so there's your team. That's the same horse. It took eight hours to get past a roadblock to get a trailer in there. There was no fire risk, uh, but that's, uh, that's how things go sometimes. So it's good to have something besides your belt with you. Uh, when you're catching, you may run into other species. This, uh, we're using our loop system, which is our technical rescue system. He's being used on this down burrow. And we're able to load him into the trailer and bring him to Davis, and he's being lifted there in a similar structure. I can tell you about that loop system. In my opinion, it's the, uh, the simplest and easiest to use for rescue. And then you may be asked to do different things. I just threw this in that uh, we were there and saw these koi fish dying. So we established a uh, system with a aerator that we made from a tire, you know, something that inflates tires. So we're back with our horse friends there. And that horse just got a real bad sore nose. And uh, people that know about horses and can safely examine them like uh, you folks that have the sanctuary, really important. So that's just showing some of the other little guides that we have. A lot of hoof injuries, so knowing how to wrap a foot, uh, keeping the horses uh, hydrated and happy. Our team, uh, all creatures, great and small. And uh, that little guy there, we evacuated uh, and uh, just showing some of our team. So for evacuation, uh, the horses, I'm, I'm getting some more text here, so I don't know, uh, uh, let's see. I Dr. Think... Madigan, that's your five minute warning. That's your little bell. You've got to leave okay, room for Dr. McConaughey. I your bell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I we was got Dr. 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 McConaughey but... in the wing. So take it, take it from, oh, okay. keep well, going. Yeah, I, I thought... <laughs> Yeah, I thought yours was, was, was terrific, by the way. It was just, uh, there's so much to cover just like this. So thanks for the reminder though. And yours was wonderful, thank you. So effective evacuation of horses is essential to do early. So, you know, you're gonna go, where am I gonna put my horse? Well, I think I'll tie him to a telephone pole. Well, we usually wouldn't say that's a good idea, but compared to where this horse was, it is a good idea. And then you get to an area where you can transport him. And this is how you can evacuate in, in Southern California. Um, notice uh, the, uh, the, the owner in the trunk is wearing a helmet. That's good safety. So there's two options here, evacuate or shelter in place. 
And the best thing you can do is evacuate early. It's not always practical, but how do you evacuate? You trail out, you ride out, you lead out, you turn horses loose. Uh, now th that raises a big red flag. So is this a good idea? So let's get into that a little bit. So evacuation associated health issues. So what they are is that when you have to evacuate, it's pretty frequent now and it can be short notice and you can have trailer injuries, human injuries, as I talked about. But you can have situations where housing density and lots of horses uh, are, are, are put together when you do evacuate and then you have biosecurity issues. So that's really an important consideration. You get secondary flight injuries. You have many evacuations that occur at night. So uh, if you can practice doing all that, that's great. And uh, have every horse load perfectly. Okay, well, that varies day to day with my horse a little bit. And uh, so it's important. So let's get into this topic about your, 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 you've got an impending fire. Should you, you know, it's gonna consume that place what are your options when you can't evacuate? Well, uh, there's hazards if you turn them loose for the first responder vehicles and whatnot. Horses will want to go back to where they're familiar with their activities and uh, where they live. They will go back into a fire. So if you have to shelter in place or you think you will, then clear at least 100 feet in all directions. Don't leave them in the barn. Remove them from all nearby structures, put food and ID tag IDs and all that stuff. Uh, so here's the situation. I'll just give you my last example here is there's a 50 horse sanctuary and uh, you have an immediate uh, eminent uh, fire coming and you don't have the defensible space or adequate personnel. So, and you've got horses in small paddocks and other things. So making an assessment, where would be the safest place for those horses? And can you uh, let them loose from where they are and allow them to be in some degree of secondary confinement that is more diffuse and allows them to possibly survive? So if the safe area, let's see, I gotta get rid of that. If the safe area, the horse has exited as a barn, they'll try to get back in. Uh, you can let people know if you've had to turn horses loose. So the first responders on the radios that are coming in know to look out for horses. Try to create a secondary capture confinement area if you can. And then later on, put out a call for some helpers to come in with grain and halters and, and capture them. So it may be that you actually have to have to do that at times. So the main point is evacuate early if you can have a buddy system. Uh, keep in mind that roads may close and you may not be allowed to enter if you wait too long. A couple of questions come up. Are they afraid of smoke? No, but they're afraid of lots of funny looking people in red suits that with sirens and things like that. And this horse has got some hay there to calm them. Food is calming. So those are little tricks you guys all know. So I'll uh, end on time. And, uh, and I'll take any questions at a later time. So thanks very much. Dr. Madigan, thanks so much, not only for sharing incredible information with everyone, but as my friend for agreeing to uh, step up and, and do this. So I wanna let everybody know, no surprise, we're running a little bit long. All of your questions will be captured. If we do not have time for a live Q&A at the end, um, we will make sure that your questions are answered. And if you would like to send additional questions to us at halterproject.org, our email address is rescue at halterfund.org. All the information is um, in the slides. We'll make sure that these incredible vets have a chance to answer your questions personally. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Madigan. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Rebecca McConico, um, another dear friend at the other side of the country who like Dr. M has seen way more than her share of big incidents. So thank you, thank you, Dr. McConico. Thank you, Julie. Um, give me a thumbs up or, or good if you can hear me. Um, I, you so, are good. Thank you so much. You're good. 
a great privilege to be here. I want to thank um, Helms for for Horses Coalition. It's an honor and privilege to to be speaking alongside Julie Atwood and Dr. John Madigan. Um, great friends for a long time. So many things that they have both already said apply um, absolutely to what I'm going to speak about. So I'm going to focus more on um, the the health impacts and show you those via some experiences that we've had. Uh, so we're going to play the game of next slide. Um, and to give you a little bit of background from me and from us in Louisiana, we see a lot of stuff, uh, mostly water related. Uh, we have, um, I've lived in Louisiana since 1999 and uh, just started basically it being a way of life for us. And we had to adjust. We, we had to work together as a team to get our act together since this is a part of our our life and so there's the list there of um, many of the events that we've dealt with most of those are disasters on a large um, on a large scale uh, we do obviously have emergencies smaller scale and so uh, next slide so this was last summer and uh, we had we even had two hurricanes arrive on one day uh, one of them kind of fizzled out but um, you can see where we we have to be prepared. We have to uh, work together as a team. Uh, next slide. This is, I just wanted to give a big shout out to uh, the folks that basically are there all the time to help us and support us. Uh, we work together uh, with the universities, uh, LSU and Louisiana Tech have a great uh, collaboration, cooperation with teaching and teaching animal science students, teaching veterinary students. And I'm um, going all the way back to pre-Katrina days. Uh, this, these are the people tried and true that we have worked with over the years. Um, individual communities have gotten their local, we have parishes here in Louisiana, not counties. So we have parts, <laughs> uh, parish uh, community animal response teams that may or may not actually be official. I think by now everyone uh, pretty much knows that you gotta work through your local animal control um, and work through the incident command system to have things work together. Um, and so keeping that information flowing and keeping the new people coming in, the younger generation um, in the pipeline for that is really important because we kind of went for a little bit of, of time where like the people that knew what they were doing kind of aged out and then the new people, it was all new to them. And they were people maybe not necessarily from local areas that had dealt with that so much. So, um, so with that, I am going to move on to the next slide. So as far as flood injuries go and you break up the, the animal body into uh, systems, um, just like in the fire situation, we have a lot of skin issues. Uh, and musculoskeletal issues. Um, so we'll see limb, head, neck, uh, trunk lacerations, abrasions, lots of lameness, hoof injuries. Um, animals struggle a lot. They tend to get a myositis, uh, pretty significant dermatitis and cellulitis, and then subsequent sepsis. So they'll get infected, bacterial and fungal infections. We do see an awful lot of eye problems, just like we would in any type of emergency or disaster scenario involving um, nature. And uh, GI colic is always a big thing. And uh, when maybe we can do another one of these when we talk about sheltering and how to, how to take care of animals during shelters, because that's another whole topic. Uh, neurologic conditions and then respiratory conditions. Uh, next slide. So I want to mention about um, trees. Uh, and Dr. Madigan already discussed that sometimes you don't have the ability to take an animal to a triage location. Obviously, this horse um, struggled. I, I'll tell you, the horse did not survive. Uh, this is one uh, from Hurricane Isaac. As you can see, the little picture in the corner is the very tip or the boot of Louisiana below New Orleans. And there's a lot of industry. Uh, down the Mississippi River in that area. There are a lot of people that live down there. There's a levee system that then ends abruptly. And so a lot of people keep a lot of animals down in that area. And so when you do have an animal that has not been evacuated, 
uh, and then gets in a situation such as this. Um, the animals struggle. Uh, if you can get them out of there, just imagine during the struggle, the aspiration in that second picture, you can even see blood around his nostrils. So he's probably already got um, aspiration pneumonia, secondary things going on. The horse did uh, free his, himself, um, but then was later uh, euthanized humanely. And so what we do though, when we have situations like this, we, um, and say you have several animals you're looking at at a time or you're um, working very quickly because you only have a couple minutes to deal with a patient or an animal, um, you wanna look at three, well, four things really, their respiratory rate, their pulse rate, uh, their pulse pr pressure, um, and their that can include their mucous membrane color. I think for me, the first thing I like to do, as long as the horse is approachable, is to look up under their lip and look at their gums and see if they're purple, um, see if they have a refill time. Um, that gives you probably the quickest a uh, way to see how sick an animal is. We had a, a group of blister beetle affected horses come in off a trailer at one point and um, could just go down the line and, and see which ones you needed to get in order to, who was the sickest, who needed to be treated first. Uh, maybe even some that, that don't waste your time on because they're not gonna survive. Um, so those are tough situations. And then look at the neurologic status of those patients. Um, next slide. So this is a horse, we, we actually had um, a paper we wrote. I always felt like after Katrina, we needed to share our learning experience. And so we've tried to publish every time we have an event that seems like some that the public uh, and the masses would benefit from the situation, from learning about our experiences. So uh, we try to publish our experiential um, efforts out in, out in the field with emergencies and disasters. And so we, we published an article about three different horses and I'll tell you now, none of these three survived, um, but we, we, we learned a lot about these and there are so many animals affected, hopefully not this seriously, but this is to prompt people to get a plan together so they don't have to deal with these types of situations. Um, so this was Hurricane Isaac, so 2012, I um, mean, you could see this horse, we, we spent about a day and a half trying to communicate how to get to that horse. Uh, and he was obviously injured. You can see him there in the middle on that first uh, picture on the left. Um, and then here's what happens when the owner evacuates, leaves the horse behind, and then the horse is seriously injured and he is able to be taken to um, a location of triage and of veterinary care, very, um, very good medical care but we didn't have a way to get him to the teaching hospital and, or to a referral hospital. And so this horse um, may have fared better if it had, um, the owner had left a plan. And so this, this horse ended up having extensive uh, leg injury, actually lived for a good while. Um, we were able to get him to the teaching hospital and after a couple of days and treated him with um, aggressive debridement of that injury and he actually was doing very, very well. And then he foundered, unfortunately. Um, so that was the outcome of that one. So next slide. So this is another one. It actually was owned by the same owner of the horse that I talked about in the triage slide. And so this is in Plaquemines, Louisiana. Uh, well, not Plaquemines, Plaquemines Parish. And this horse uh, was found in the storm debris. And you see the National Guard um, first responders are down there helping. And we've got um, an LSAR, which is a Louisiana State Animal Response Team um, member assisting. And then the horse, you're probably wondering why people are nonchalantly standing around. The horse, uh, we weren't ready yet to remove that horse and get it up into the trailer. And so it struggled so much that we went ahead and got a, a towel around her head and then we're able to get her moved and up onto a, um, and we didn't have, we didn't have the glide, the large animal glide at the time, but we did have lots of uh, strong, healthy service people that could help us get this horse into the trailer. And then she had been out in um, that storm debris for several days. She'd been in the sun and she'd also been exposed to a, you could, there are a lot of chemical plants down there. So we, she was exposed to a lot of chemicals 
we weren't really sure which chemicals we found out later um, and how we need to, to deal with that. And we really thought this horse was not gonna survive um, that night. And so we were able to get her in the trailer and provide emergency care in the trailer, um, intravenous fluids by flashlight and uh, try to get her to where we could get her to the hospital the next day. Uh, next slide. So we have to be very careful when we're working with these animals um, because we, you know, they've got a strong smell, a, a strong odor of chemical. And this horse ended up being exposed to toluene and styrene. And we were able to call the department, the environmental quality folks, and they told us we just really needed to not get it on our skin and that it was not an inhalant um, concern from the horse and so we were able to decontaminate the horse and so usually for deconning a, a large animal we'll use um, just a detergent a mild detergent we like using blue dawn uh, we use that in the oil spill um, and it, it works great and as long as you get it rinsed off and we were able to decon that horse and then treat the wounds um, and so she did very well for about three weeks next slide and unfortunately, she ended up um, having severe laminitis situation in a support limb and then was euthanized. The owner, you know, initially we did have funds to treat her and there were donations that were used to treat horses like this, but we ended up, um, they did not want to continue once the horse did have um, pretty serious founder situation that would have taken another several months and um, lots probably to the tune of ten to twenty thousand dollars to treat her and they were not able to to provide that for her and probably should have never named her Hope um, but that was her name originally that wasn't named post hurricane. Next slide and the third one from Hurricane Isaac was a horse named Chico that was uh, owned by a gentleman there in the middle um, and he had cattle that he ran down there in uh, that, that lower parish of Louisiana. And he also uh, was an oyster farmer as well. And um, so he, that's his home. There's a whole um, uh, area of uh, Vietnamese folks that, that live down there that farm together. Um, that's their home. They would never think about going anywhere else. And so that was his best horse, of course, his favorite one. And we ended up organizing with the local energy company um, to get to be able to um, have a permission to use the uh, swamp buggy to pull that horse out. And that was, look at that situation. That, that was a very dangerous situation. All those horses, we were in um, hazmat type area. You have to be careful with your first responder team members that they're trained and what they need to do. Um, and that people aren't injured. That swamp buggy actually was, um, had to go about a fourth of a mile and they had to go through um, a lot of water and the road was actually unstable and that, that uh, piece of equipment was tilted a couple of times to where they thought they were gonna flip. So think how catastrophic that would be. So I share that story just because thankfully um, we were able to get the horse out and it was able to be taken to the teaching hospital. Um, but, you know, it could have been disastrous for the people and the horse. Um, so next slide, uh, continuing on with Chico. So he was the sickest and most injured of the three. Uh, he had uh, gross ulceration in his mouth. His legs were basically macerated and I probably should have taken that slide out, but this is really what, um, what we had to deal with there and he did not live for very long we tried to treat him he had a fungal pneumonia he actually had uh, on uh, autopsy which is well on necropsy which is animal autopsy he had fungus in his brain so he, this horse actually aspirated a lot and had circulating um, fungal organisms and was just septic respiratory wise uh, and systemic wise Okay, I hope I'm not grossing people out too much. Sometimes I get a little immune to that just because it's just what we do. And I've done this for many years. So I apologize for that if it's uh, difficult to see. Um, next slide, please. 
So in 2016, um, you may have heard, may not, um, we had a really bad flood in uh, just almost a flash flood in the Baton Rouge area. So right there by the veterinary school. And we had, I won't, I won't say no warning, but it rains a lot down there. And, uh, but it, ne it hadn't rained this much uh, at one time. And so even around the veterinary school, it was flooded. Um, and so we had a lot of horses that came in with, um, uh, we called them the waterline horses because they'd been standing in water for a good long period of time before the waters receded. And some of the horses uh, were secondarily later ended up getting fungal infections. So Pythium is one of those types of organisms in the environment that can then uh, take hold in horses that have been exposed and been injured. And I know I'm probably running out of time here, but um, can I keep going or do you need me to, to wind it up? You can go for about another five minutes. Does that work for you? Yeah, I'll just zip on through this. Super. Yep. Thank okay. you. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the waterline horses. Now I know everyone's interested in what to keep in your veterinary stash. Um, so if you have a good relationship, and I recommend everyone have a good relationship with your veterinarian so they can prescribe things when they actually can't be there. And Dr. Madigan had mentioned, you know, FaceTime and, and Zooming with your horse so um, your veterinarian can tell you what to have on hand and how to use different things. So uh, on these horses, we did decon, we did daily hydrotherapy. We did not use bandaging um, because it seemed to make things worse. Uh, we used a lot of silver sulfadiazine, expensive, but a, a wonderful topical medication, systemic anti-inflammatory, systemic antimicrobials, uh, your, you know, your antimicrobials of choice uh, with your vet. And then we did put all these horses on a sy systemic um, fluconazole and we had a lot, the AAP Foundation and um, donors and industry partners helped us a lot with donations of uh, pharmaceuticals. And so we were able to, to treat a lot of horses. Next slide. Okay, so um, just a couple of mentions on respiratory. So I already talked about aspiration pneumonia. So we saw quite a lot of that. We saw a lot of neurologic diseases, um, that time of year, we start seeing an increase in encephalitis, the, the um, mosquito-borne uh, viruses that, um, you know, we had this, la this last summer, they had outbreaks of um, just infestation of mosquitoes. So we did see an increase in encephalitis cases. Uh, next slide. So uh, just keeping in mind what, you know, people are going to risk their life to take care of their animals. Let's hope that we can plan, 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 just like um, Julie tried to impress upon everybody, what Dr. Madigan tried to impress on everyone, but have a plan so you're not out there trying to get your horses in the middle of a disaster where you're gonna get injured. Uh, next slide, be mindful of the hazards uh, the water hazards, the uh, chemicals in the environment, that's a ant hill pile, the fire ants that we see, and they, they basically build little islands uh, during floods. They, they're on every fecal ball that's floating out there. They make big piles, and if you bump into those things, they will just crawl all over you, and they have quite a sting. Um, next slide. I can't say enough about social media being helpful in these situations that can be hurtful at times, but having um, a network uh, with your people you can trust with um, getting you know that those first 12 to 24 hours of a disaster, knowing the people you can call, get people trained, uh, have training with um, the, the experts, learn it ahead of time. Next slide. Um, technical large animal rescue is not simple. It can be very dangerous and it's very important to work with those. And there's just a little list there of people that, have, that we've worked with over the years. Uh, we did a lot of work with the, the oil spill, ha having people take that HAZWOPER training, which is a HAZMAT combination. And then I'm just gonna leave you next slide with a mention of, about feeding horses. Um, I really just had a slide or two on this anyhow, but basically if you can get those horses 
just some good hay, uh, feed them all at the same time, make sure they have water. One of the biggest problems we had was um, people feeding them and then people coming right be behind us and, and feeding them some more and other people coming through. And so having a, a security on the areas where you're feeding those animals so they don't get overfed, um, make sure that they have water, make sure that um, there's security working together at your sheltering situation. Um, next slide. And then having um, your public as educated as possible. It seems like people are most receptive when there's an impending storm or event. And so trying to find those windows of time, um, having six hurricanes in one summer this last year, people really got uh, fatigued on the um, getting ready. And, and so people got to where they weren't even gonna evacuate. And, and that's very understandable, it's very costly. So, but sharing information at LSU Ag Center has been great. Um, we did write a little sum, a summary about flood injury and horses that's available. I put that um, PDF in the resources page. And then next slide, um, just to keep people studying and learning and working together to, to encourage people to write and share your stories, uh, whether it's scientific based or, um, just newsworthy, thehorse.com's been great about covering things and many others on, last slide. And now I think we're ready for some questions, um, but thanks everyone. And sorry, I kind of did a rush through there, but um, anytime anybody needs to contact me, I'm happy to share anything and, and help with anything. Dr. McConico, thank you so much. And Dr. Madigan, I'm gonna uh, wrap up for a quick second here. Um, can't thank both of our veterinary rock stars enough for spending this time and putting these presentations together. For those of you who are participating live today and those of you who will be watching and listening to this in the recorded version downstream, all of these resources are gonna be available to you. We've created a fabulous Dropbox. You'll find the link at Halter Project. Dot org. Um, if you're taking part in this um, activity, you'll get follow-up information from our hosts. Uh, a, um, and I'm going to let Elaine wrap up with some housekeeping. I uh, just want everyone to know that this is a huge topic and our takeaway is that we are very grateful to all of you rescue and sanctuary owners and operators for doing the work that you do. You have a huge responsibility to a great many animals and we are here to help you keep those animals safe and also to be role models for your communities. You really can be. Um, my takeaway to you is this, if you are not as fully engaged with all of the resources in your community that help animals and people in emergencies and disasters, that's what I want you to take away. Get involved, get engaged, be a resource, be a helper, as Mr. Rogers liked to say, okay? We need all of you. We need all of you to stay safe and to be as prepared and ready as you can. And that's why we have all come together to bring you this presentation this morning. If you have questions, you can write to any of the speakers and uh, we'll collect information and get it back to you. Thanks for listening. And now I'm gonna let, let, let Elaine wrap it up. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you, Julie. Well, this has been just fantastic. I'm sure many of us would like to listen to these three presenters share their knowledge and experience with us all day. Each of them could do their own uh, webinar and still have lots of information to share. So thank you three so much for coming today. I just want to very quickly mention that we have some other webinars coming up in future months. The next one will be about the differences between handling, caring for, and treating and training donkeys and mules and burros from horses. They're very different. They have very different needs, different dietary, different emergency medication needs, and so forth. Marjorie Farabee, who's one of the nation's top uh, burrow and donkey experts, she's the equine manager 
in uh, at Texas Miracle Ranch in Texas, where they have over 400 donkeys, will lead that webinar with some associates. Uh, we also have Linda Pirelli, who's coming to do a special webinar for us on a way to train horses to load so that the loaders are not endangered and the horse will be happy to load in almost any kind of circumstance, even when panicked and so forth. And how to help get horses to load that aren't trained to load when you need to get them evacuated quickly. So both of those are coming up in the future. Um, I wanna ask everybody to be sure to make uh, put homes for horses coalition at gmail.com in your email contacts uh, so that you get our messages, emails, and our monthly e magazine and it doesn't go to your spam or disappear. Gmail has a new email format where emails like ours go into something called a promotions box. And you can adjust that so that these messages from us will go into your main Gmail, or you may need to just check that promotions box frequently because we don't want you to miss uh, information about these upcoming events. Um, I want to introduce Joanna Grossman very quickly to say a few words about our sponsor and uh, host Animal Welfare Institute. And after that, we will say goodbye. We don't have uh, questions at this point, I don't believe. Uh, any questions that come Elaine, in, that Julie mentioned, we will uh, add to the recording that will be put out. Yes, Julie? Elaine and um, Joanne and Sydney, who's there in the wings, I just want to say very quickly, Thank you, thank you, thank you to AWI and the Homes for Horses Coalition for inviting me. Um, and I, I was able to drag along my wonderful guests, Dr. Rebecca McConico and Dr. John Madigan. I'm speaking to you from Sonoma County, California. Dr. John is up near the University of California at Davis and Dr. McConico is in Louisiana. Elaine is in uh, Denver and um, our hosts with AWI are in Washington, D.C. So it really takes a village. And we want to thank all of you for doing the work that you do. At the end of this seminar, we're making available to everybody who is participating and those who will participate afterward um, in the recorded version. We have a very extensive Dropbox folder. You can find it at our website halterproject.org and uh, in it you will find all of the tools that you need to develop your emergency and disaster action plans. That's really what we want you to take away from this. The importance of having a plan. Don't bite off more than you can chew. It's not a one-size-fits-all project and we have done our best to provide you with the tools and information you need to create a personalized plan that fits your rescue or sanctuary. And we are all here to help. So any questions that you have afterward, we will be um, collating them, we'll get back to you. And that, that information will be available to all the attendees. So thanks to uh, Homes for Horses Coalition and Animal Welfare Institute for including us. And Joanna, I'll let you close out. Thank, thank you so much, Julie. I just wanted to echo my thanks to Julie, of course, our fantastic presenters, Dr. Madigan and Dr. McConico, and to Elaine as well. Um, as Elaine mentioned, I'm the Equine Program Manager and Senior Advisor at AWI. Um, and thanks to those of you, of course, who joined today and took time out of your busy schedules. We really appreciate it. Um, it, it means a lot to us. Um, as Julie said, please do visit the website uh, where you're able to get all of the resources that were presented today. Um, and just briefly, I just uh, for those of you who aren't members, um, AWI founded the Homes for Horses Coalition in 2007. Uh, the goal of HHC is to foster growth and collaboration among equine rescues and to end horse slaughter as well. Um, so these are, of course, initiatives that we are very dear to our heart and that we um, hope to make good headway on in the next year or two. Um, you know, the past year has certainly been challenging, I think, for all of us uh, due to the pandemic, but We've been delighted to be able to continue to offer resources and information and provide programming. Um, it's really important for us. We know how important the sense is of having a community to equine rescues. And so um, we certainly look forward to offering more webinars in the months ahead. 
Um, so with that being said, again, thank you everybody who joined today. Um, and you, you're welcome to visit our website, awionline.org, to learn about our legislative priorities for the coming session of Congress and specifically uh, the SAFE Act to hopefully ban horse slaughter permanently here and the export of horses abroad for slaughter as well. So thank you, everybody. Joanna, thank you. A couple of questions very quickly. Um, people are asking if they can watch this again. So would somebody like to jump in and let our uh, attendees today know how you can go back? Yes, this presentation is being recorded. Um, and all of the information, the resources reside on our website. That's halterproject.org. But in terms of accessing this, can somebody step in and let our current listeners know how they can uh, attend this yes. live portion once again? Yes, we are recording this. We will be adding some information at the end with additional links and so forth. And then that will be posted on our Homes for Horses members only page on Facebook on the official Homes for Horses Coalition page that's open to the public on Facebook. Uh, hopefully also on YouTube so that it can easily be accessed by anyone and we'll be sending it out in an email to all the registrants. Uh, some of the people who registered weren't able to actually be on with us today. So we'll sort of give them first shot at having this to review after we have it already. It may be a few days, but we'll make it available to everybody. And with that, I will say goodbye from us all. Thank you all so much for being here and have a safe, healthy and prepared 2021. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Stay safe out there.